And now a word from our sponsor, Smarsh. Organizations continue to embrace the hybrid work model as they reap the benefits of allowing employees to work remotely and collaborate across many channels. But hybrid work has caused an explosion of communications data that has to be captured, retained, and most importantly, understood. A new hybrid world requires compliance leaders to embrace innovation and employ new compliance technology. At Smarsh, we help compliance teams work more efficiently and uncover more misconduct than with legacy solutions. Our communications intelligence platform spans the entire life cycle of the data, making compliance feel seamless. Visit smarsh.com slash intelligence to learn more about our best-in-class technologies, including elastic compute, natural language processing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. That's S-M-A-R-S-H dot com slash intelligence. Unlock the signals in your communications data today. What opportunities does it present? So there's no doubt in my mind that climate change is the greatest threat to humanity that we are experiencing right now. And I would put it up there with the threat of nuclear war with the Soviet Union back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And you know that was very formative for me growing up in the 70s and 80s. And the fear and the misunderstanding that a lot of Americans might have had during that time. And so I would put climate change up there. It's, it's definitely a threat to humanity and, and the way we live. But I also see it as the greatest economic opportunity that humans have ever seen. Welcome to the Innovation and in Compliance Podcast, part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Join us every week as we talk with industry innovators who are making compliance to help business run more efficiently and at the end of the day, more profitably. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today I have with me Don McPherson. Don has, I'm not quite sure if I would call it a practice, a business, or just interests, but it's some of the most interesting interests that I've come across lately. So I asked him if he would come on the pod and he graciously uh, took some time from his schedule. So Don, first of all, welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. Thanks for having me on the show, Tom. Don, could you tell the audience a little bit about your uh, academic and professional background? My academic background is I have a bachelor's degree in history and mass communications, and I have a fast, deep fascination around history. And I think that has really informed how I view the future as well, which I know we'll get into. Also part of my academic background is travel. And so while it doesn't show up on my resume, travel has been a huge part of my life since my early 20s. I traveled to 74 countries. And next month, I was scheduled to go to Antarctica, which would have been my seventh continent. That's going to have to wait because of COVID. But being in different cultures has had a huge influence on me. I've lived a couple of times in Europe. I've lived in Denmark, studied there. And in my mid-20s, I sold everything I had and moved to Germany for a year and had an incredible experience over there. So travel has been hugely important for me. Professionally, I've mainly been an entrepreneur for the last 25 years or so. I've started five companies, 12 Geniuses being the last one of them. A lot of people would, might know me from a company we sold in 2016 called Modern Survey. That's where I spent about 17 years in the HR space, but that essentially encapsulates my professional background. So did you have a specialty in your uh, history degree? I was most interested in 20th century history and particularly World War II. That's kind of what drew me to Europe a couple of different times. And so I've probably been to Europe 50 times or so over the last couple of decades. Just find that period of time really fascinating in terms of how modern it was and how it was so transformational for where we are today. That would be the beginning of modern, modern history. So I also have a history degree and my specialty was Central European history, French Revolution to the present, which at that time was 1978. So if you want to know about the greater kingdom of Bohemia circa 1800, I'm your guy. And I used to do a lot of transactional work as a lawyer. And my goal is to do 
contracts, negotiate contracts on all seven continents. I have one left, and I'm going to figure out a way to fly to Antarctica and even do a handshake deal so I can fulfill my seven. So I'm completely with you on that. Oh, that's awesome. I was intrigued by it's your- rare, rare. Yeah, it's rare was... to find somebody who has traveled that much. Yep, lived overseas myself, and I have an English wife. So that brings another unique perspective. But I was a little bit intrigued, actually more than a little bit, I was intrigued by your work in HR, talent acquisition, and that part of your career. And I was wondering, because you were in it for, looked like 20 years or so, how did that particular profession evolve? And how did you, or what themes did you take from that to really move to your current role as a futurist? So the background is I was living in Germany and my sister called me a couple of weeks before I was moving back. And she said, do you want I've got this part-time job for you when you come back. Are you interested? And it was answering calls from leaders at American Express about their employee survey results. And I knew nothing about any of that. But I said, yes, I, I'm happy to do that. I've answered calls before. I've worked in the call center. And that started this you know, almost 25-year journey working in employee motivation and employee engagement and human resources. And what I have learned over that time, the biggest lesson is just an increasing importance in talent and making sure organizations have the right talent. The ones that win the talent war are going to be most successful. And what I have found is that we can differentiate our organizations a few different ways internally as it relates to employees. Um, we can communicate most more effectively. We can provide our employees with better tools and resources, or we can maximize the effectiveness of our talent. And especially over the last decade, I've seen that the first two things, communication and tools and resources, have become more commoditized. And so the great differentiator is then how do we get the most out of our employees? How can we engage them better? How can we retain them? How can we help them grow and develop? so we can get the most out of our organization. And it's, this is becoming more and more important, especially right now as we're seeing, you know, and organizations are not able to hire people. They're not able to retain people. The ones that will get, make it through this pandemic and be the least affected by it are going to reap huge benefits. So I have seen over the last two decades, but especially this last decade, how, just how important having the right people in your organization is. So I generally judge a podcast by two categories. One, how much I enjoy it, or two, how much I learn. But I'm actually I now have to have a third category, which is how many blog posts I get out of it. I've gotten three already, and we haven't got to the good stuff yet. So <laughs> this is absolutely great. One of your jobs, and I'm just going to read the title because I've never heard of this title before, Head of Global Talent Marketing at Aon. I was really intrigued by that. Did you actually market Aon's Global Talent Solution? Were you helping to bring people in? What was that role and, and what did you take away from that? Aon bought my company, the company that I started with two partners in 2016. And so we went from 50-person software company to 50,000 people. and one of the business units that Aon had, or it was a four different business units put together, was talent. And when they bought us, they put me in this global talent marketing position. And I was responsible for marketing their culture and engagement solutions, their assessment solutions, leadership solutions, and HR strategy solutions. And so at that point, I got to understand talent far more holistically than I'd ever thought about it before. I was just thinking about you know, having the right people in the organization, how do we engage them? How do we create the right culture? But I got a better sense for assessing people as they are coming into the organization, making the right promotional decisions, how to train leaders, how to look at HR more holistically. And what we did was we really had a, a global marketing perspective where we wanted to use the data that we had collected over a period of years and help educate organizations around the talent trends that were happening and that they needed to be prepared for. And so I got to speak around the world. I got to market to you know, all of these companies around the world, 
just how much information we knew about HR, leadership, culture, and engagement. And, and that was a job. I did that for 25 months, and it was incredibly informative to where I am for what, what I'm doing right now. So pre-pandemic, you took a sabbatical to study, quote, the technologies and social influences that are dramatically changing the way we live and work. If I could start off with uh, why did you do this and what were some of the conclusions that you came to coming out of your sabbatical year? The reason I did it was I was really focused on software, employee engagement, my company, and had been so for almost two decades. And when I kind of pulled back and started to look at the world around me, I realized that it had changed dramatically. And, you know, things like mobile technologies and social media were hugely important in 2016 and 2018, and they didn't exist in 2003 or 2005. And so I wanted to just take a year to study all of the changes that had happened over the last decade and, and even before that to get a better sense of what is this world that I'm entering and then figure out how I needed to reinvent myself so I could continue to be relevant for the next two or three decades. That's why I did it. And the thing that I realized is that the world had in fact changed in, in very dramatic ways and uh, talked about social and talked about mobile, but things like gay rights, that has become hugely influential and, and has changed very dramatically from the 1990s and, and early 2000s, gay marriage becoming legal across the country. And so I was really fascinated about all of these social and technology changes and how they were interrelated. And so that was one thing that I had learned. And, and I, wanted, I was committed to ex continuing to explore these different things. But the other thing that happened, Tom, is something really life-changing happened for me. And I don't know if it was because I was leaving corporate America or I was embarking on this great exploration around these different trends, or if it was the birth of my second daughter and the kind of the completion of my family. You know, that was the last child we were going to have. But all hate left my body. And, you know, this is a very divisive time in our country. And I was really exploring these different topics and really kind of moving away from knowing to wanting to explore and wanting to understand. And so I think it was the combination of all of those things that really changed who I was. It's not like I spent a lot of time thinking about things that I hated or people or situations, but that just left my body and my desire to learn more and understand people and where they're coming from increased at a dramatic level. Just, I'm a fundamentally a different person than I was three years ago. So that really leads us up to your current business venture, 12 Geniuses. And I wanted to start with asking you, what is a polymath in training? <laughs> so I think it's important to understand what a polymath is. And I didn't know what the word was until a few years ago, but a polymath is a person of wide ranging knowledge and learning. And so you can think about people like, you know, well-known polymaths like Da Vinci or Nikola Tesla. And da Vinci is an artist and a scientist and inventor and ages ago. And Tesla, I think he spoke eight languages and he was a great inventor. And so, you know, these are people. And, and the, other, the other one I think about is Brian May. And so if you're a music aficionado, you know, he's, he's the guitarist from Queen, but he's also an astrophysicist. And so I, I have an interest in studying a wide range of topics. The reason why I call it a polymath in training is I don't ever believe that I'm going to get to the level of a Tesla or a Da Vinci or a Brian May, but I have a desire to learn about a broad range of topics. So that's what a polymath in training is. I'll always be in training. And I'm always interested in helping others cultivate an interest and a curiosity about all sorts of different things, whether it's science, technology, social trends, humanities, arts, sports, whatever. Is a polymath fundamentally different than a Renaissance man? I think it's pretty similar. 
Yeah, okay. I, would, I would say, yeah, that they're very similar. Yeah. Renaissance man in training too. <laughs> it's, it's a possibility to add to the business card. Really, one of the things that intrigued me about you is, is your insatiable curiosity. I, in many ways, am the same ways. But I was wondering right now, what are two or three of the top things that are holding your interest or that you're really uh, exploring thoroughly? The first that comes to mind is climate change. And when I think about climate change, I've done a number of different episodes on 12 Geniuses about climate change. And it's such a complex topic, the way that I think about it. So I don't think about it just from uh, the earth is warming and, and what's going to happen and how can we slow this down or stop it. I think about it from two ways. Why did we get here? What benefits have we gotten out of it? So that would be kind of the first way that I think about it. And then the other is what opportunities does it present? So there's no doubt in my mind that climate change is the greatest threat to humanity that we are experiencing right now. And I would put it up there with the threat of nuclear war with the Soviet Union back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And you know that was very formative for me growing up in the 70s and 80s. And the fear and the misunderstanding that a lot of Americans might have had during that time. And so I would put climate change up there. It's, it's definitely a threat to humanity and, and the way we live. But I also see it as the greatest economic opportunity that humans have ever seen. And you know whether it's through carbon capture technology, or I don't know if you saw this recently, but I think it was Purdue University, some scientists at Purdue University created the whitest paint ever. And there's a theory that if we painted roofs, black roofs with this white paint, that it would reflect sun, the sunlight back instead of absorbing it like a dark roof does. So different technologies, different solutions for combating climate change are going to allow a company like Tesla to reach a $1 trillion valuation, whereas all the auto makers combined don't reach a trillion dollar valuation. The other thing that I think about when I think about climate change is what has the earth warming allowed us to do? And if you think about 200 years since the industrial revolution, it has enabled us to build these incredible buildings, create this incredible infrastructure that we enjoy today, allowed us to travel, allowed us incredible advances in science that have added decades to our lives just in 120 years without putting an incredible amount of carbon into our atmosphere we would not enjoy the privileges that the advancements that society enjoys today so we have to think about that too yes we have to get this carbon out of the atmosphere and try to slow the the uh, warming of the earth take care of climate refugees where they may be. We also, also can use this as an, an opportunity here in, in the United States and other countries around the world with aging populations and, and not enough future workers to embrace immigration if, if possible. So I think about climate change uh, from a lot of different angles, but you know, see it as a risk and see it as an incredible opportunity. And organizations that identify and embrace this opportunity are, are going to take advantage of it. And another thing that I'm, I'm thinking about is cancel culture. And I find this, obviously, if, if people have done really awful things, yes, we should hold them accountable. But I, I think about it, too, in that what are we doing today that our great-grandchildren are going to look back at and say, oh my gosh, what were these people thinking? What were they doing? And I'm thinking about treatment of animals and I'm thinking about how we're dealing with uh, homeless, homeless population or imprisonment of the people for lifetime sentences for nonviolent crimes, you know, things like that. And I think if we, if we think about some of the things that we're doing now that history is going to judge, judge us very negatively on, we might have a little bit more empathy and think about you know, what life might have been like 200 years ago or 100 years ago and, and kind of cut, cut some people some slack. So yeah, I think about cancel culture in that way. I've been thinking about that quite a bit lately. So 
you have quite a few of your pods, as you mentioned, that deal with climate change. But I was wondering, do you have a couple of favorites or podcasts that are really meaningful to you personally? It's the question that I get most about the podcast. And it's such a difficult question to ask because, uh, answer because I think now I've had maybe 60 guests on the show. But a, a few that stick out would be one I did with John Creasel. John is from Minnesota. He served in Iraq and he was, uh, he lost both his legs in a roadside bomb. And he is one of the most positive, upbeat human beings you will ever meet. And I just wanted to learn about his experience and see how he reinvented himself and now has created this incredible life, a wife child who's, I think, maybe two years old, two and a half years old now. So that one comes to mind. Another one that comes to mind is Brother Ali. He's my favorite living musician. So for me, it's James Brown and Brother Ali. And Brother Ali is a hip-hop artist from Minneapolis. He grew up here. I think he's living in Turkey now, but he's also legally blind. So not only did he appear on the podcast, but I was able to pick him up at his home and drive him to the studio where we did the podcast. And so I had an incredible conversation with him on the way to the studio. We had a great interview. And then we had a, this incredible conversation <laughs> afterwards. So, you know, imagine lo- meeting your favorite living musician and having that sort of intimate conversation. It was just, uh, just wonderful. And then the last one I'll say is a guy by the name of Lou Manny. And he's a hockey legend, originally from Canada, but lives in Minnesota. And the reason why it was so fun to interview Lewis, he just turned 80 years old. He was instrumental in putting together the 1988 Olympic hockey team. He actually helped get Herb Brooks the coaching job. They were buddies. And (laughs) I got to go to Lou's Lou's office in downtown Minneapolis and interview him in his office. But the reason it was so meaningful for me is my dad was a big hockey fan growing up and he would take me to North Stars games and Lou was playing back then. Well, that was my dad's favorite hockey player. And I didn't tell my dad that I interviewed him. And so when the episode came out, I was able to just send him the link and say, you might want to listen to this. And my dad was just blown away. He was just so, so floored that his favorite hockey player was on his son's podcast. So those, those are a few that come to mind. So you've got a couple of other endeavors you're a part of that I wanted to ask you about, because frankly, they're both near and dear to my heart. You have inner city ducks, and although it doesn't look like it, I played sports all my life growing up, three sports in high school, and continue to work out and enjoy outdoor activities up till this time in Harmony House, which I'm really involved with the uh, recovery community, both locally and as a member of the uh, State Bar of Texas as well with our uh, Lawyer's Assistance Program. So I was wondering if you could say a few words about both of those programs. The Inner City Ducks, I started with my little brother. So I've been mentoring mostly young African-American boys from the ages of, let's say, 9 to 17. I've been doing that for almost 30 years. And the last little brother I had is is a young man named Shaquille. Now, he's 27, and we met a little over 17 years ago. And as Shaquille got a little bit older, he started to do coaching, youth coaching, football, basketball, et cetera. And he had this idea to to do some of the things that he and I did on a one-on-one basis and do it at a a larger level. So he wanted to start the inner city ducks, a football and basketball team. And he asked me to be involved and I said, yes. So there was one other coach involved. The three of us started this organization. We started with one football team, 13 kids. And we brought these kids to Chicago. We brought them to South Dakota, Madison, Wisconsin, just traveling around the Midwest, um, exposing them to different things. And the word got out. Local reporter came, did a story on us. And the story ran on a Friday. By Monday, we were 30 kids. And by that fall, I think we were up to maybe 80 kids. Mike Rowe from Dirty Job stopped by and did a little story on us. He has a show called Returning the Favor. And right now we have about 100 kids involved from ages 5 to 14. And really what we're trying to do is teach them leadership lessons and using sports as the platform to attract them. 
to play football and basketball, but it's more meaningful than that. We're really trying to help these kids understand what the world has to offer them. We're trying to help build their abilities. And then eventually we'll provide access to them through our networks. Maybe it's guidance around where they might want to go to school. All these kids are from North Minneapolis, which is economically challenged, largely African-American, a lot of pride within these neighborhoods, but there are challenges. And we're trying to help these kids. All of my work, whether it's with the Ducks, Harmony Foundation, 12 Geniuses, Think to Perform Research Institute, those are the four organizations I'm involved with. All of my work helps people reach their full performance potential. And that's what we're trying to do with these kids is help them reach the potential that they have inside of them. And poverty is a huge barrier for this. Racial injustice is a huge barrier for this. And we're trying to eliminate that for a lot of these kids. And, and so we're three years in and we've grown significantly, taking these kids on all sorts of trips, giving them incredible experiences. So I think we are achieving our mission. You had also mentioned Harmony Foundation and I serve on the board there. I personally don't struggle with addiction, but the CEO is a really good friend of mine. And we got to know each other over 20 years ago. He was just leaving a halfway house and I was his landlord. He actually rented from me. And to see this man, his career progress has been incredible. He went from working in a coffee shop to now he's CEO of a hundred person treatment facility in Colorado. He exemplifies, embodies what is possible when you solve addiction. And so I serve on the board of directors and I really help them with marketing strategy and, and human resources strategy. I, I try to help, you know, and, and I also I'm the only board member who's not in treatment. So I provide a, a different point of view and perspective on the board, but you know, I'm, very, very passionate about these organizations because they are barriers. Poverty and addiction are huge barriers for people reaching their performance. And I'm trying to re remove that as much as I can. So Don, I was going to ask you about leadership, how it's evolved coming out of the pandemic. But if I could maybe add something you said a little bit earlier, which really struck me, which is talent, talent acquisition and why talent may well be, if not the, a key differentiator from companies. And when I heard that, I immediately thought of AI. And I've advocated AI does not remove the human element, makes it even more important. But you took my thinking to a completely different level, because it's not just the human ele element, it's the talent element. It's the talent to utilize yet one more tool. So I wondered if I might be able to kind of broaden out my question from not simply leadership evolving, but how does leadership manage this new need and indeed more highly talented workforce that we'll see five, 10 years down the road? Well, you're right on the money in terms of artificial intelligence being a tool. And I think there is a lot of there are a lot of misconceptions around what AI really is. And I've done some episodes on this, but it is a tool. It's a very, very powerful tool. And in the hands of the right talent, oh my goodness, it's a game changer, right? And so yeah, I think the first thing to keep in mind is that AI probably within this decade is not going to be replacing jobs. It's going to replace tasks and, and we're already seeing that. So we're seeing this in, the, let's say, the tax field, for example, or in the legal field, for example, AI can do a lot of the research that maybe a, a young attorney would have done in the past. But that's just a task where, and yes, attracting the right talent and putting these incredibly powerful tools in their hands, that is going to change the way we work, no doubt about it. But in terms of leadership evolving, when you think about an AI world, what becomes important is emotional intelligence and the ability to connect with people. That becomes more important. And you bring them. The, the pandemic into it, we have in a lot of ways made connecting more difficult for people. So how do you connect in a virtual world? And I think these are things that leaders are going to have to solve in the coming months and certainly in the coming years, because 
we are not going to go back to the office the way we did two years ago. That just is not going to happen. There'll be hybrid workforces and, and things of, of that nature, but we're not going to go back. Not everybody's going to return to the office. And so how are we going to connect, create these cultures that retained our employees and got the best out of our employees? That's going to be a huge challenge for leaders. I think the other thing that is going to be really important is moral leadership. So what responsibility to, do we have to our employees? And that's really why I started 12 Geniuses, is I wanted to explore this, this new world. If we have self-driving cars and we have 2 million drivers in the country, a lot of those drivers may be out of jobs. So how can we prepare them three years in advance? not by in three months in advance and giving them a severance package, but three years in advance so they can manage a fleet of vehicles that are going to need maintenance or they're going to maybe work in infrastructure to build charging stations throughout the United States uh, for self-driving electric vehicles, that sort of thing. That sort of longer range talent conversation and strategy, I think, is what's going to be really important because otherwise we're going to have great technological disruption, which is going to lead to social disruption as well. So those are some of the things that are on my mind when I think about leadership evolving from these new technologies and from the pandemic. I was also intrigued by your comments around the business opportunity brought about by climate change. Uh, So if I can maybe wrap that into an ESG question and a broader just business disruption, it seems to me that you see businesses really with a great opportunity if they can determine a way to assess these events or risks or whatever you might call them, manage them, and then provide solutions around them. But the key I heard you say is the business opportunity. No doubt about it. There is no magic bullet to solve climate change. There just isn't. And what we need is you know, what I say is a thousand innovation. How many do we really need? Probably more than a thousand. But let's just say, for the sake of argument, we need a thousand innovations. We know we're going to have rising sea levels. We know we're going to have different issues with you know, deforestation and, and things of that nature. So, what are some of these solutions? I saw one innovation, a couple of innovations that, that really have blown my mind. One is in a a village, and I think it was in Pakistan or someplace in the mountains in Asia, they are pumping water uphill during the cold season. And so they're taking water from rivers and they're kind of building these glaciers and creating like storage for water for when it it becomes hot. So they they knew that they were gonna go through droughts in the, the summer and fall months, and so they're actually pumping up and kind of, kind of creating these mini glaciers. And I thought, oh my gosh, what if we scaled this? You know, maybe there are ways in which we can kind of create mini glaciers and, and create drinking water, fresh drinking water throughout the year for some of these places that are going to experience very dry climates or dry periods of time. And now that might be far-fetched, but if we think about scalability and, and use some historic examples, uh, the one that I think about is air conditioning. Air conditioning really wasn't something that was popularized in our country until after World War II. And it was just residential air conditioning was just window units in the late 40s and 50s. But think about how transformative that was in bringing Florida, a state of a million people in the 1920s, to over 20 million people today. Um, we were able to, to cool the Astrodome, Houston Astrodome, <laughs> in the 1970s. We went from window units to these incredibly scalable air conditioning units that cooled our malls, cooled our office buildings, cooled these incredibly enclosed arenas, huge arenas. Well, what if we can do that with some of these other technologies like this mini glacier system that I was talking about? You know, so that, that's just one example. And you know, there's all sorts of different innovations that are either scalable or are going to change the way we live and work. Another one that, that comes to mind is in Amsterdam or in the Netherlands, which is a country that's essentially underground and has been threatened by rising sea levels for years and years, centuries probably. 
they're building homes on the water on stilts. And so as the tide comes in, the home rises. And as it goes out, it drops. And I thought, oh, this is incredibly innovative. So for these, these places, maybe South Florida might be an example where the shorelines are going to, or the, the sea levels are gonna to continue to rise. That could be one way of allowing people to, to maintain their homes rather than just raising the homes and abandoning that real estate. So there are all sorts of really brilliant people working on these types of solutions. And in order for us to manage this, it's going to require a thousand solutions. So think about the economic opportunity in that. It's incredible. So Don, unfortunately, now that my dogs have announced, it's near the end of this podcast. But before we leave, I wanted to ask if listeners wanted any more information on yourself or 12 Monkeys, where could they go? Not 12 Monkeys. Come on, Tom. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was going to ask you about that. 12 Geniuses. Uh, no, if they, if they want more information on what we're doing, definitely go to 12geniuses.com. That's the number one, two, geniuses.com. And if you want to lo- learn more about me, you can find me on LinkedIn. It's Don McPherson, M-A-C-P-H-E-R-S-O-N. That's the best p- place to find me. Well, Don, this has been a great podcast, a ton of fun. And I guess I'm going to have one request, which is I hope we can continue this conversation. Thank you so much, Tom, and I'd be delighted to. If you want to stay up to date on the latest innovations in compliance and help your business run more efficiently, subscribe to this podcast and help spread the word by leaving a review.